Okay, before we continue, please be sure that you are confident in your understanding of the information presented in the last slide. It is very important for you to understand the role of anaerobic and aerobic ATP production during exercise, and more importantly, why we have anaerobic metabolism and when it is active. Again, just to summarize, anaerobic ATP production simply backs up aerobic ATP production when the aerobic system cannot fully meet the ATP demand of the muscle. This point or exercise intensity at which this occurs is referred to as the anaerobic threshold. And remember, the reason why the aerobic system cannot fully meet the ATP demand at this anaerobic threshold point is because the oxygen availability in the muscle does not meet the very high oxygen demand that the aerobic systems need to meet the ATP demand of the muscle. So again, to describe the anaerobic system, it is an ATP producing system that does not require oxygen and it exists to back up the aerobic system and fulfills the portion of ATP demand that the aerobic system cannot. So the anaerobic system is active when oxygen availability does not meet oxygen demand for the aerobic system to have enough ATP producing quote unquote power to meet the ATP demand. In other words, the anaerobic system is active when muscles are under a hypoxic state, which we discussed in the prior slide. Now during exercise post anaerobic threshold, the rate of ATP demand is really, really high. And like I said, the aerobic system cannot keep up with this rate of demand. So it makes sense that the backup system, i.e. the anaerobic system, not only does it not require oxygen, but it is a very fast energy system, meaning anaerobic systems produce ATP at a very high rate. During post anaerobic threshold exercise, such as sprinting, not only do your muscle cells need a lot of ATP, it needs it fast. So the anaerobic system kicks in to back up the aerobic system to provide that ATP at a very fast rate. So what we are discussing here is the system that is represented by this red area under the curve, the backup to the aerobic system during post anaerobic threshold exercise. So from here to here. So what are the anaerobic backup systems? In other words, what are the anaerobic pathways? We use the term pathway in metabolism to describe the series of biochemical reactions in a dedicated pathway. So the two anaerobic pathways are indicated here. We have the phosphagen system, also known as the alactic system, and fast glycolysis or the lactic system. These two systems, again, do not require oxygen and produce ATP relatively fast. So high amounts of ATP per second. They become highly active at the post anaerobic threshold intensity. So from here onward, and again, serve to back up the aerobic system when the aerobic system cannot meet the full ATP demand. ATP demand is up here aerobic systems ATP production is right here. So what fills this gap is the anaerobic system. So as I said, these bioenergetic systems produce ATP by breaking up fuel molecules and releasing the energy in the fuel molecules and transferring them to form those phosphate bonds on ATP, thus producing ATP. So the next question is for these two ATP producing anaerobic pathways, what are the fuel sources for each pathway? For the phosphagen system, aka a lactic system, it is a small fuel molecule called phosphocreatine, or PCR for short. Phosphocreatine, also known as creatine phosphate. And we will discuss how we use phosphocreatine as a fuel to form ATP. Now for the lactic system or fast glycolysis, the fuel source is carbohydrates or CHO for short. Now, like I said before, we utilize endogenous fuel sources, fuel that is inside our body stored somewhere. We have two endogenous carbohydrate sources. One is glucose, which is the simplest form of a carbohydrate molecule. Glucose is largely produced and released by the liver 
and it mainly exists primarily in circulation, so outside of the muscle cell. And this is why I use the term extracellular to describe the location of glucose outside of the muscle cell circulating in blood. So it is constantly circulating for various cells in the body like muscle cells to uptake it to use as fuel. And we will explain this process of glucose uptake into muscle cells later on. The other endogenous carb source is a stored form of glucose. This is referred to as glycogen. Think of glycogen as a bunch of glucose molecules bonded together to form a larger carb molecule. Glycogen is meant to be stored inside various cells, especially the muscle cell. In the muscle cell, glycogen is used as a fuel for ATP production through a process called glycolysis, which we will talk about in a few moments. So blood glucose and muscle glycogen are two fuel sources that is used to produce ATP through fast glycolysis, aka the lactic system. Okay, and again, glucose exists in blood circulation, so it is extracellular outside of the muscle cell, and glycogen is stored inside the muscle cell, so it is intracellular fuel sources. So here are some recap questions. What is the fuel source for the alactic or phosphagen system? The answer is phosphocreatine or creatine phosphate or PCR for short. Which of the following fuel sources are utilized to form ATP via the lactic system or fast glycolysis? The answer is carbohydrates, which can be further broken down to glycogen and glucose. All right, so let's go ahead and discuss each of these two anaerobic pathways, which again, one, do not require oxygen, two, produce ATP very fast, and three, exist to back up the aerobic system when the aerobic system cannot meet the full ATP demand during post-anaerobic threshold intensities of exercise. So first, let's start with the alactic system. Some other commonly used terms to describe the alactic system are, again, the phosphagen system or the ATP phosphocreatine system. Either one of these three terms can be used interchangeably, so please keep that in mind. For the most part, I will refer to this system as the phosphagen system. So as we introduced in the last slide, the fuel source for the phosphagen system is phosphocreatine or creatine phosphate. This is a creatine molecule bonded to a phosphate. And within that bond, there is high amounts of energy. So phosphocreatine is a high energy compound, or in other words, a fuel. And it is found in some limited amounts in the cell's cytoplasm or sarcoplasm when we're talking about muscle cells. This is again the semi-fluid substance within the cell. So generally speaking, through the phosphagen system or pathway, the phosphocreatine is broken up, the energy is released, it is then transferred to form a phosphate bond on ADP, thus forming ATP. In other words, the ADP is rephosphorylated. It gains another phosphate, and the energy that was just transferred is held in that added phosphate bond. Remember, the ATP holds that energy in that phosphate bond for a very brief period of time until it is hydrolyzed on that myosin head to provide energy for muscle contractions. So as it was just generally described, you can see that this is a fairly simple pathway, and it is. This pathway only involves one biochemical reaction, which is a lot less than all the other bioenergetic pathways that we will talk about. And because this pathway only has one single reaction, it produces ATP at a very high rate, meaning it is a very fast ATP producing pathway, which again is a common characteristic of anaerobic systems in general. In fact, the phosphagen system is the fastest ATP producing pathway of all the bioenergetic pathways in your body. Again, I repeat as a point of emphasis, the phosphagen system is the fastest ATP producing system of all the bioenergetic systems. Why? Mainly because it only requires one single reaction as denoted by this arrow to release all the energy from this fuel source, phosphocreatine, 
to resynthesize or form ATP. So the pathway is visualized here, which we will discuss in more detail in the following slide. But I just wanted you to be able to visualize it and understand that once this ATP is formed, it is going to be used through ATP hydrolysis, which I went over in the previous slides, to provide the energy for muscle contractions right here on the myosin head to power cross bridge cycling, which is again, the mechanism that drives muscle contractions. Okay, so let's talk about this simple pathway in much more detail. So in biochemical reactions, we first need reactants or substrates. These are molecules or chemicals that undergo change through the reactions, in this case, one reaction. So here we have ADP, which is adenosine diphosphate, which only has two phosphates and just some energy within the existing phosphate bonds. But we want to turn this into ATP to provide the muscle cells with the energy currency to power muscle contractions. In the phosphagen system, we have one of the reactants or substrates as a fuel molecule. As we said, the fuel for the phosphagen system is phosphocreatine, denoted by the PCR here. So through a reaction, we want to release the energy in phosphocreatine and transfer it to form a phosphate bond on ADP to temporarily store that energy until it is hydrolyzed. So this arrow, let's focus on the top one here, represents the reaction. And these are the products of the reaction. We have, of course, ATP, which is the whole point of this reaction. And this came from the rephosphorylation of ADP. A phosphate was added to the ADP. And the energy from the phosphocreatine is now transferred and trapped, quote unquote, in that last phosphate bond in ATP. We are also left with just a creatine molecule. So we see that the phosphate on phosphocreatine is now missing. Why? Because the energy in phosphocreatine that was released and transferred was held in that phosphate to creatine bond. So by breaking off that phosphate, the energy was released. And because that phosphate was broken off of phosphocreatine, we are now just left with creatine. And yes, the phosphate that just broke off from the phosphocreatine can be used to rephosphorylate ADP. So this phosphate can indeed be transferred to this ADP with the transfer of the energy. So in summary, the phosphocreatine is broken up the energy in the phosphocreatine bond is released and transferred to form a new phosphate bond on ADP, thus creating ATP. Now, of course, for any reaction, we need a catalyst, which is in the form of an enzyme protein. The enzyme that catalyzes this reaction in the phosphagen system is called creatine kinase, or CK for short. Now, just as a side note, a kinase is a type of enzyme that phosphorylates something or adds a phosphate as done here on ADP. Also, as you can see here that there are two arrows going in the opposite direction. This means this reaction is bi-directional. It can either go this way or this way, meaning Phosphocreatine can be broken down to resynthesize ATP, and ATP can also be broken down or hydrolyzed to resynthesize phosphocreatine. So let's talk about this reaction during exercise, especially post-anaerobic threshold exercise like sprinting, for example. Which direction do you think this reaction will go? Of course, it will go towards the right because the whole point is to meet the rising ATP at a fast rate. We want to produce ATP, so during exercise, especially post-anaerobic threshold exercise, this reaction will be pushed to the right. So CK will catalyze this reaction from left to right to produce ATP by transferring the energy through the breaking up of phosphocreatine. So how does CK know to do that? Well, first, remember, when ATP is hydrolyzed on that myosin head, the last phosphate breaks off and you are left with ADP and a free phosphate. And then the ADP is rephosphorylated back to ATP through bioenergetic systems like the phosphagen system, as we see here. 
Now, when you exercise, obviously there's increased ATP hydrolysis on that myosin head and therefore increased ADP levels inside the muscle cell. Now, CK is sensitive to the rate of ADP change in that when there is a rapid rise in ADP inside the muscle cell, CK becomes more active. I will repeat, CK is sensitive to the rate of ADP change in the muscle cell in that when there's a rapid rise in ADP in the muscle cell, like when ATP is rapidly hydrolyzed on that myosin head, CK becomes more active. It knows now with the buildup of ADP, it knows that it needs to rephosphorylate that ADP to provide more ATP. So when it becomes highly active, it catalyzes this reaction to form ATP at a very high rate. So when you're exercising really hard like you would during post anaerobic threshold exercise or when you are sprinting, for example, the rapid rise in ADP from rapid ATP hydrolysis on that myosin head will increase the activity of CK, creatine kinase. In this situation, again, creatine kinase would catalyze this reaction towards the right, thereby rapidly rephosphorylating ADP and thus resynthesizing ATP, again, at a very fast rate because there's just one reaction to do that. Now, during resting situation, it would be in the opposite direction. Rest is a situation in which the muscle cells are not very active, and thus a good time to replenish phosphocreatine stores by transferring the energy from ATP back to creatine, thereby rephosphorylating creatine, producing phosphocreatine. So just to recap, the important takeaway here is that during exercise, especially post anaerobic threshold exercise, the creatine kinase activity will increase in response to rising ADP levels inside the muscle cells. The rising ADP levels is due to the rapid hydrolysis of ATP on that myosin head. So once it senses this, it thinks, well, we need to produce ATP very fast. We need to resynthesize it. So it does it by catalyzing this one single reaction, breaking up phosphocreatine, taking the energy from phosphocreatine, and adding it into that last phosphate bond onto ADP, thus forming ATP. And of course, you're left with just a creatine molecule because you just broke off that phosphate. Okay, so now here is a summary of the key characteristics of the phosphagen system. Remember, this is anaerobic ATP production. First, it is extremely fast and powerful. And again, this is essentially because of the fact that it requires only one biochemical reaction to produce ATP, as you see here. Now, the general rule is the more reactions, the more time it takes to yield ATP. So out of all the bioenergetic pathways we will go over in this lecture series, the phosphagen system is the fastest because it has the least amount of reactions required to produce ATP. Now, the second characteristic of the phosphagen system is that although it is very fast and powerful, it is very limited in capacity meaning even though there is only one reaction to produce ATP from phosphocreatine, you only get one ATP worth of energy from a single phosphocreatine molecule. So the net yield from one phosphocreatine through the phosphagen system is one ATP. But on the other hand, you get that ATP very, very fast. What this also means is that there is highly limited phosphocreatine levels in the muscle meaning during post anaerobic threshold exercise, especially towards max intensity, phosphocreatine levels in the muscle cells will deplete relatively fast. On the upside, however, phosphocreatine resynthesis is also a fast process. So in between sets or during post exercise recovery, phosphocreatine levels in the muscle cells is usually replenished quite efficiently. So for the exam, please be sure to know all the detailed characteristics of the phosphagen system as indicated on this slide. If I ask a question asking which of the following systems produce ATP at the fastest rate, meaning ATP per second, for example, it would be the phosphagen system. If I asked which of the following systems produce the least amount of ATP, 
per single fuel molecule, it would be the phosphagen system. One phosphocreatine equals one ATP. Now, just for reiteration, let's answer the question of when is the phosphagen system most active? We know that it is an anaerobic system, so it is mostly active during exercise intensities post anaerobic threshold. But as you can see in this figure down here, the phosphagen system's activity rises exponentially as exercise intensity increases past the anaerobic threshold and is most active during maximum intensity, which would be like sprinting or high load exercise like during a set of resistance exercise. Now this makes sense since at maximum intensity, the rate of ATP demand is at its highest. And thus, it would make sense that the muscle cells rely on an anaerobic backup system that can produce ATP at the fastest rate. This again is the phosphagen system. So in summary, here is a description of the situation in which the phosphagen system is most active. Please take careful note of this. One, during maximum intensity exercise. Two, during post anaerobic threshold exercise, which is what describes maximum intensity exercise. Three, during exercise in which the aerobic system has reached its ATP producing capacity, also known as the aerobic capacity. And four, during situations in which the aerobic system cannot meet the full ATP demand of the muscle cells. Now, all four of these descriptions, as you can see, are all interrelated. They all pretty much describe the same situation. So please be able to understand those four circumstances in which the phosphagen system is most active. Now, another situation in which the phosphagen system is temporarily highly active is simply at the onset of exercise. At the onset of exercise, the aerobic system is a little debilitated and does not have good ATP producing power. Now, why do you think that is? Well, as soon as you start to exercise, the muscle's oxygen demand increases. But here's the thing. The oxygen availability is low inside the muscle because the cardiovascular system needs a bit of time to get that elevated oxygen availability to the muscle. The heart needs to adjust to get more oxygenated blood pumping, and the vascular system needs to redirect oxygenated blood towards the active muscle. This takes a bit of time. Until then, the aerobic anaerobic curves look something like this. As you can see, the anaerobic threshold is really low at the onset of exercise. And thus, even at lower intensities, you may be above the anaerobic threshold. So this white curve that represents aerobic ATP production is low because again, the cardiovascular system needs some time to get the needed oxygen to the active muscles. Until then, the curves look like this. So at the onset of exercise, the active muscles are more reliant on non-oxygen requiring anaerobic systems such as the phosphagen system. When some time passes, usually just a few seconds or maybe sometimes a minute depending, the cardiovascular system is able to deliver sufficient oxygen to the active muscles and the muscle can now rely mostly on the aerobic system. So the left figure here is the normal curves and the right is how the curves look temporarily at the onset of exercise until the cardiovascular system can get the required level of oxygen delivered to the active muscles. So remember, I said that the post anaerobic threshold environment is stressful and thus fatiguing. You cannot sustain exercise for a very long time post anaerobic threshold. We will discuss this a little bit more later, but for now understand that this is why the onset of exercise, even like a simple jog, can feel fatiguing in the beginning because again, the cardiovascular system requires a bit of time to deliver the required oxygen to the muscles. Only after a bit of time passes, the fatiguing effect dissipates. This is the basis of a warm-up. 
a warm-up is fundamentally designed to get your cardiovascular system adjusted to the energy and thus oxygen demands of exercise, thus making sure your muscles' aerobic anaerobic curves look like this on the left at the start of exercise, and you don't start exercise with your curves looking like this, with your anaerobic threshold really low and your aerobic system with low ATP-producing power. Now, as I introduced earlier, the phosphagen system has a very limited capacity in that there is limited phosphocreatine stores in the muscle at any given time. Now, this figure here exhibits the rate of change in muscle ATP and phosphocreatine during all-out maximum intensity exercise. Now, one of the lab procedures in exercise physiology is called the Wingate test, which is a 30-second all-out cycling sprint. Now this is to measure your fatigue resistance during max effort exercise. So this figure demonstrates what happens to your muscles phosphocreatine levels as you perform this test. So the red line represents phosphocreatine levels in the muscle and the blue lines represent ATP levels in the muscle. So as you start your cycling sprint, again an all out maximum effort sprint, the existing ATP levels deplete right away because they are hydrolyzed since the muscles are contracting. Now, as the ATP is being rapidly hydrolyzed, the ADP levels will rise very fast. And remember, this will trigger creatine kinase. Creatine kinase will become highly active and thus the phosphagen system will start to produce ATP very rapidly. So here we see phosphocreatine levels depleting at a very fast rate, since again, the phosphagen system involves the breakdown of phosphocreatine to produce ATP. So the phosphocreatine levels drop and the ATP levels are maintained to power the high intensity muscle contractions. Now, as you continue to sprint cycle as hard as possible, the ATP production starts to drop from the phosphagen system, as you can see here. Why? because your phosphagen system is running out of its fuel. It is running out of phosphocreatine, as you can see right here. As you can see, as the phosphocreatine depletes further to almost empty, the ATP production also starts to drop because the muscle relies heavily on the phosphagen system to fulfill the ATP demand that the aerobic system cannot cover during sprint level maximum intensity exercise. So at this point, you have exhaustion, which is a little different from fatigue. Exhaustion is fatigue due to the depletion of fuel, which is the case here and exhaustion of phosphocreatine during max intensity exercise is just one, again, just one of the many factors that may contribute to fatigue during maximum effort or maximum intensity exercise. So as a recap question here, which of the following describes why ATP production via the phosphagen system is limited? The answer would be because phosphocreatine levels are limited and deplete at a rate commensurate or proportionate to the level of exercise intensity or effort. So at maximum intensity exercise, like an all out sprint cycle, phosphocreatine levels will deplete the fastest. Now going along with that, if I ask the true or false question, an all out sprint will deplete phosphocreatine levels faster than jogging. The answer is true. Okay, now that we understand the phosphagen system and how phosphocreatine is used as fuel to generate ATP through the system, let's talk a little bit about where phosphocreatine comes from. Well, generally speaking, phosphocreatine comes from the phosphorylation of creatine. During that process, energy is quote unquote trapped inside the phospho to creatine bond. So where does creatine come from? Because phosphocreatine is utilized by the body, especially skeletal muscle, as fuel through the phosphagen system, creatine can be considered a nutrient. However, creatine is not, I repeat, not an essential nutrient. An essential nutrient is a nutrient that your body does not produce and consuming it through some exogenous source is required. Creatine is therefore non-essential because your body produces it. As indicated here, it is produced 
from the metabolism of three amino acids, mainly in the liver and the kidneys. The other source of creatine is through exogenous sources. In other words, from your diet. Most meat eaters get a good consistent intake of creatine since creatine is largely found in animal meat, especially fish and beef. So in summary, creatine can be produced by the body and it also can be consumed through the diet. Now where can creatine be found? Most of the creatine found in the body is in skeletal muscle, mainly in the form of phosphocreatine, again, a phosphorylated creatine. The reason why most of the creatine is found in skeletal muscle is because simply among all the organs in the body, skeletal muscle utilizes creatine in the form of phosphocreatine the most because it is a valuable fuel source for rapid ATP production, especially during post anaerobic threshold exercise intensities. Other areas creatine can be found and utilized is the heart muscles, also known as cardiac muscles, the brain tissue, as well as testes. Now, most of us are somewhat familiar with the term creatine because we hear about it a lot as a dietary supplement for performance enhancement, otherwise known as a dietary ergogenic aid. Now, many athletes or training individuals supplement their diet for additional creatine for the purpose of enhancing performance. So what is the concept behind creatine supplementation? So first, let's go over the dynamics of creatine in the body. Creatine, as you see here, is circulating in the blood. Again, this can come from the production in the liver or kidneys, or it can come from the consumption of creatine through the diet. Either way, creatine can circulate and it can be taken up by muscle cells. Now, although it's not shown here, the uptake of creatine into the muscle cell is an active transport system, meaning on the membrane of the muscle cell, which is called the sarcolemma, there are tons of these membrane receptors called creatine transporters. And its function is just like the term implies. It transports creatine from the blood and into the muscle cells. So just imagine a membrane protein, again, called a creatine transporter right here, bringing that creatine out of the blood and into the muscle cell. So once the creatine transporter brings the creatine into the muscle cell, the muscle cells usually phosphorylates it, putting energy into it and creating phosphocreatine, also known as creatine phosphate. And this is depicted right here. Now this phosphorylation of creatine and thus creating phosphocreatine occurs mainly when the muscle is less active, like during rest. So here we have phosphocreatine, again known as creatine phosphate, and you can see that the creatine is attached to a phosphate, and in this bond you have quote unquote trapped energy. Now when the muscle is active and becomes more reliant on the phosphagen system for ATP production, the phosphocreatine undergoes the reaction which breaks it apart, and the energy and the phosphate is transferred to ADP, as you see here, to form ATP, as you see here. This again is the phosphagen system in a nutshell. So the question that came up about three decades ago by scientists was that, is there a way to increase the levels of phosphocreatine inside the muscle cells? And could this enhance the ATP producing capacity of the phosphagen system? A very logical question since more fuel for the phosphagen system can conceivably improve the amount of ATP that can be produced by the phosphagen system. So the first question is, can supplementing additional creatine through the diet increase muscle creatine and therefore phosphocreatine levels? Well, let's dive into the scientific research to answer this question. Okay, here we have one of the pioneer studies in creatine supplementation conducted way back in 1992. Now in this study by Harris and colleagues, subjects were given 20 to 30 grams of creatine per day for two days straight. Now this is one of the original studies, so dosing was not very well understood, and I will say that 20 to 30 grams per day is a little too much. But this was 1992, and again, dosing was not very well understood at this point. 
So subjects consumed 20 to 30 grams per day for two days straight, and the researchers examined whether creatine and phosphocreatine levels inside muscle cells increased in response to this creatine supplementation. So this study involved muscle biopsies and examination of muscle creatine and muscle phosphocreatine levels before and after the creatine supplementation treatment. Now what the researchers found was that muscle creatine levels significantly increased 20 to 50% following supplementation. And this increase in muscle creatine reflected also a significant increase in muscle phosphocreatine levels. Since I said earlier that when creatine is taken up by muscle cells, it is primarily converted to phosphocreatine to be later used as a fuel for the phosphogen system. So based on this study and many, many other studies that replicated these results, supplementation of exogenous creatine increases muscle creatine and phosphocreatine content. Now, does this increase in muscle creatine and phosphocreatine translate to improved exercise performance? Now, that is another question that we will examine in a bit. But first, another interesting finding in this study was that there were responders and non-responders, meaning there was a group of subjects who exhibited this increase in muscle creatine and phosphocreatine after creatine supplementation. Now this group was considered the responders. And another group did not experience any change after supplementation. And these subjects within this group are the non-responders. So what differentiated the responders from the non-responders? The responders who experienced an increase in muscle creatine and phosphocreatine were those who had an exercise history, meaning these subjects were active individuals. Those who did not experience an increase in muscle creatine and phosphocreatine, despite supplementing 30 grams per day, were sedentary individuals. This is a very interesting finding because it shapes how creatine supplementation should be applied and recommended. Based on this information here, would you recommend creatine supplementation for the purpose of raising muscle creatine and phosphocreatine levels to those who are sedentary without any exercise history? The answer is no, because based on this evidence, not only from this study, but others as well, creatine supplementation does not have any significant effect on muscle creatine and phosphocreatine levels in sedentary individuals. So if you were a trainer and a client without any exercise history approaches you before starting their training program and asks about supplementing creatine, what would you advise? You should advise based on evidence that creatine supplementation would not be beneficial for them since it would not raise their muscle creatine and phosphocreatine levels, which would be the whole point of supplementing creatine in the first place. So let's do some critical thinking here. Why do you think sedentary individuals do not experience an increase in muscle creatine and phosphocreatine after supplementing creatine? Well, one explanation could be that sedentary individuals do not work their muscles and thus their muscles rarely are in situations where it has a higher ATP demand. In other words, the phosphagen system in sedentary individuals are rarely active and thus phosphocreatine is rarely utilized or ever depleted. So perhaps the body does not see any reason to store additional creatine and phosphocreatine in muscles that rarely use it. This is of course in theory, but there is evidence to suggest this theory to be the likely explanation as to why sedentary individuals do not respond to creatine supplementation in terms of muscle creatine and phosphocreatine content. So the next question is, does this increase in muscle phosphocreatine content translate to improved performance? Well, first, let's look at some theoretical models and the benefits of increased muscle phosphocreatine stores before examining the research evidence. So let's take the same figure as we presented earlier. As I explained, the ATP producing capacity of the phosphagen system is highly dependent and thereby limited on the available phosphocreatine in the muscle, since phosphocreatine is the fuel that contains the energy required to transfer to form ATP. So the idea behind creatine supplementation is to raise muscle phosphocreatine levels, which we know can occur based on the evidence, at least in active individuals. And theoretically, 
this should result in something like this. For any given time of exercise, especially high to max intensity exercise, post anaerobic threshold exercise, there is more phosphocreatine available for the phosphagen system to produce ATP with. This means the point at which phosphocreatine levels are exhausted can be theoretically extended. And this could translate to improved performance, more specifically, improved exercise capacity to be able to do simply more work. Now let's look at this in another theoretical model more related to resistance exercise. Now here we see the levels of muscle phosphocreatine after multiple sets of resistance exercise. So say this is four sets of the back squat. Now the blue line represents a condition of normal resting phosphocreatine levels, so without supplementation of creatine. And the yellow line represents a condition of enhanced resting phosphocreatine levels due to, say, creatine supplementation. So this figure represents how increased levels of resting muscle phosphocreatine could affect phosphocreatine levels during multi-set exercise like when you lift weights. So after one set, you utilize the phosphocreatine so it depletes. Now as a percentage of starting phosphocreatine levels, those with normal resting phosphocreatine levels deplete their phosphocreatine stores a lot further than those with enhanced resting phosphocreatine levels, simply because those with enhanced phosphocreatine levels start off with more creatine. So after a single set, they are left with more in the phosphocreatine quote unquote tank. Then after multiple sets, there is less overall depletion of muscle phosphocreatine in those who had enhanced resting muscle phosphocreatine levels due to creatine supplementation. Now this could theoretically translate to increased amount of work during a resistance exercise bout. More weight and more volume can possibly be performed. So what does the research evidence say about this? So of all the dietary ergogenic aids, at least legal ones, creatine, more specifically creatine monohydrate, which is the most common form of creatine supplementation, is considered one of the most effective dietary ergogenic aids. This is the whole reason why I'm spending time talking about it. So the question is, does it work? When people ask you questions like this, you have to make sure to put it into context. Does it work? Well, yes. The research shows that creatine works specifically in the context in raising muscle phosphocreatine levels. And this seems to translate to improved high intensity exercise capacity due to greater levels of fuel available for the phosphagen system. This is how you should answer these questions. Do not simply say, yes, it works, because there is no context there. So the reason why creatine has been considered one of the most effective performance supplements is because of the huge body of research evidence that suggests that it is. Now here is something very important for you to understand. Not one single study will determine whether a dietary supplement is effective or not. This is not how we make conclusions on the efficacy of any type of intervention, such as dietary supplementation. We consider the body of evidence. The reason being is that one single study cannot cover the array of variables that can possibly alter the effects of the intervention. For example, if one study said five grams of creatine supplementation for one month improved performance in repeated sprint intervals in well-trained male subjects, would you then make a gross statement saying that creatine simply works? No, you should not. Why? Well, because what if creatine does not produce the same results in female subjects or untrained subjects or an endurance exercise or with two grams of creatine for only two weeks, et cetera, et cetera. You see, not one single study can examine the full effects of the intervention in a variety of situations or conditions. So this is why you have to examine the full body of evidence that is available to make solid conclusions. And this, for the most part, will take some time to develop. 
So yes, since the early days of creatine research in exercise science and nutrition science, there have been thousands of research studies that examine the effects of creatine supplementation on performance. And about 70% of those studies have reported a significant improvement in some measure of exercise performance with creatine supplementation. These include, but are not limited to, changes or enhancements in muscle mass and strength and repeated sprint performance. Overall, creatine supplementation can help aid in improving exercise capacity. In other words, the ability to do more work, especially high intensity work. It does not just simply make you stronger and faster directly. It is mainly a way to improve the amount of work performed during training. More reps, more sets, more volume in other words. Now here is another important factor to consider. Although the research indicates that creatine supplementation can be an effective performance supplement, the effect is nevertheless small. Now this is the case for every quote unquote effective supplement that has been researched. If the supplement was effective and produced a very large magnitude of effect, then the supplement would likely be too controversial to be considered legal in most sports. This is why synthetic analogs of testosterone, also known simply as anabolic steroids, for example, is banned in sports and is very controversial because the magnitude of its performance enhancing effect is relatively large. So creatine, although the research shows it to be beneficial for exercise capacity, the effects are nevertheless small. So you should not consider creatine as a solution. It should only be considered as a supplement to your training and of course your diet. It is only to provide an aid, not a solution. That is the case for all dietary supplements that are considered ergogenic aids. Now the next three slides demonstrate some basic research that has been done on creatine. And you can definitely take a look at the information provided here on your own time. Nothing on the exam will be asked specifically on those research studies presented in the next three slides as shown here. They are only included just to provide some examples of research studies done in creatine supplementation and performance. Now, of course, as with any dietary supplement, there is concern with safety. Creatine, particularly creatine monohydrate, has shown to be very safe, even with high dosages. And we will talk about appropriate and effective dosages in the next slide. So most of the reported adverse effects of creatine supplementation have been anecdotal and not evidence-based. There has been reports in research, however, on GI distress, but that is likely caused by the increased levels of hydrates in creatine monohydrate, which are substances that contain water or its constituents. Now, what does the evidence suggest in terms of application? First, muscle phosphocreatine stores can be fully saturated and enhanced after a loading period of five grams four times per day, so 20 grams per day, for about five to seven days. You do not need to consume 20 grams after this period since your muscles will be fully saturated, meaning phosphocreatine levels have reached its capacity by this time. Now, after this loading period, three to five grams per day would be sufficient to maintain muscle phosphocreatine levels throughout periods of training. The loading period is not necessarily critical, but if time is of essence, like during off-season training, then it may be a good idea to get your muscle creatine stores, more specifically phosphocreatine stores, fully saturated before training. Also keep in mind, creatine should not be considered a pre-workout stimulant. It is not a stimulant like caffeine. It does not have any stimulant compounds. It is a nutrient and the whole point of creatine supplementation is simply to improve muscle creatine and phosphocreatine stores. This is the same idea as increasing carbohydrate intake to improve carbohydrate stores in the body. This doesn't mean you can't take creatine pre-workout, but don't take it pre-workout thinking it is a stimulant. The creatine you consume before your workout will have no bearing or influence on that particular workout. It needs to be digested, absorbed, circulated, taken up by the muscle, and metabolized to form phosphocreatine in muscle. This takes some time. 
Now also, the research has shown that co-consumption of creatine, more particularly creatine monohydrate with carbohydrates, improves muscle creatine and phosphocreatine content compared to just taking creatine monohydrate by itself. The reason being is because carbs help improve muscle creatine uptake. Now, how does this work? Now, this may be a potential bonus question, so pay attention here. When you consume carbohydrates, this stimulates the release of a hormone called insulin. Now, insulin is mainly for the purpose of stimulating glucose uptake into various cells in the body, since eating carbohydrates increases blood glucose levels temporarily. But another effect of insulin is the stimulation of creatine transporters, which again are the receptors on muscle cells that are responsible for taking up creatine from the blood and into the muscle cell. So mixing creatine monohydrate with a bottle of Gatorade, for example, which has about like 20 to 25 grams of simple carbohydrates in just a regular bottle, may be ideal to maximize muscle creatine uptake and thus muscle phosphocreatine levels. Now here, I copied a link to a free scientific article on the recent evidence-based recommendations for creatine supplementation. And you can find a lot of good info here that you can apply. Now, this is a much better resource for information than just reading some random blog written by some gym bro out there on the internet. Now, lastly, I highly recommend that if you do look into supplementing creatine or you are advising someone to supplement creatine, purchase a standalone supplement, meaning the supplement is only creatine and not anything else mixed in. Do not purchase supplements like this. This supplement contains what we call in the industry proprietary blends. This is a marketing scheme commonly used in the dietary supplement industry. Now the term proprietary blend is used to suggest that there is some secret sauce in this supplement and that there is a unique combination of ingredients within these so-called proprietary blends. Well, the real reason why proprietary blends are used in the supplement industry is so that the manufacturer or supplement company does not need to disclose the amount of each ingredient within that supplement blend. So as you can see here, we have four different proprietary blends in one single supplement. And in each proprietary blend, there are multiple ingredients mixed in. The issue with this is that only the dosage of the entire blend, as you can see here, is disclosed to the consumer, but not the dosage of each individual ingredients listed within each of these proprietary blends. This means you have absolutely no idea how much of each ingredient you are consuming. So in this particular proprietary blend within the supplement, it contains 12 different ingredients and you have creatine monohydrate as one of the ingredients. And this entire blend is 10,000 milligrams or 10 grams. We know that the effective dosage to support muscle creatine levels is five grams per day. But with this supplement, you have no idea how much creatine you are actually consuming. Not to mention, you are consuming ingredients that perhaps are ineffective, not evidence-based, or not desirable, not to mention unsafe. So bottom line is you have less control of what you consume if you consume these types of supplements. Do not buy in to the proprietary blend strategy that these companies utilize. There are also some negative sides of the supplement industry related to proprietary blends, but since this video is on a public platform, I won't disclose that here since that can be a liability for me. However, if you are interested in learning more about the industry and the dark side of it, feel free to reach out. I do a lot of independent consulting in the supplement industry so I can give you some inside info so you can make an informed decision about your dietary supplements. It is a very, very, buyer beware environment, the dietary supplement industry. So in conclusion, go with the standalone supplement as you see here. This has only one ingredient, creatine monohydrate at five grams per serving or scoop. Simple and effective. 